Each day is a gift from God. Each day is a gift from God. Let's make the most of each one. So just a short prayer before we begin our service today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of today. We thank you for your continuing love of all of us, for forgiving us, for blessing us. We think back over the last weeks especially, and we lift to you all those things we are grateful and thankful for. All those things that we need to say sorry for. And those times when we have felt or seen your blessings. We join together this morning, united as part of your church, connected through the Holy Spirit to lift our worship and praise to you. Lord, we worship you. Send your Holy Spirit now to be among us, we pray. Then we can stand and sing, Light of the World.
take a seat. So I'm, I'm set with setting the scene today in preparation for Alan's message. And as I was starting to think about what I was going to talk about, um, I saw a little um, picture come up from Muddy Church. I think I've mentioned Muddy Church before. Um, so along the lines of Messy Church in some ways, but they very much encourage that we spend time outside um, in God's creation and wonder as we wander is their kind of lovely phrase and looking at what we see. And I thought that this little, this little picture they shared this week uh, linked quite well to what I was going to talk about because they were talking about the squirrel. We've got a lovely little squirrel that comes in our garden. It's not a red one. We'd love it to be red, really, but they're quite rare, aren't they? A little grey squirrel who I do like, but there's moments when we fall out, me and the little squirrel. Because I also like the birds, and squirrels do like bird food. <laughs> and they have this lovely way, don't they, of hanging onto the tree with their back legs, if you've ever watched one. And it doesn't matter where, and Rosemary's nodding her head, doesn't matter where you've put or how long a piece of string you've hung the bird nuts or sunflower hearts on, that squirrel's determined to get them, and before you know it, they're all over the garden floor, and the birds don't get any, and Cyril the squirrel, as we've named him, wins again. The other times that I fall out with little Cyril the squirrel is when I see him on my lawn. Oh, it's not a very precious lawn, really. I don't know why I get bothered, but there you go. And he, he digs, and he digs a little hole, and he digs up his nut, and off he goes. He doesn't, he doesn't re-put the, he doesn't put the turf back there again. He just leaves my little hole. But I'm fascinated by my little squirrel because he knows exactly where those nuts are every time. He doesn't randomly dig holes across my lawn. He just digs them where the nuts are. And this thing popped up from Muddy Church this week. Squirrels bury. How many, how many nuts do squirrels bury? Has anyone got any idea? 600. Higher. Don't you read the thing? Oh, he's naughty. <laughs> Higher than 600. A Higher than 1,000. 3,000. 3,000. <laughs> Three, there's some help going on behind me, I know. 3,000 nuts, and they remember where they all are. Well, when I play that memory game where there's 15 things on a tray, I can't even remember. And I started that, I walk upstairs, and I've gone upstairs to something. Someone else is nodding their head. And I get there, and I think, oh, I don't know what I've come upstairs for. <laughs> but 3,000 nuts. And this lovely, oh, you can't read it very well. On the, on the left-hand side, on the far side, it tells us there that squirrels store up up to 3,000 nuts all over the place. And their brains grow by 15% so that they can remember where they are. That's handy, isn't it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can buy that little bit of 15% gain in uh, Sainsbury's because that might help me then remember all those things because I, I look for something in our house and I go through every drawer in the house. <laughs> and I still don't find it. Evil, <laughs> clearly, that's what I need to do. But it got me thinking, why do they do it? Well, why they get ready, don't they, for when there's no nuts around and there's no nuts hanging on my tree and they need some food. So I was thinking about what else we get ready for at the moment. Yeah, I'm going over here to my pots. Does that take me in and out of the sunshine as well? So I've brought my suitcase today. Pete will be very impressed. I've packed my suitcase and we, I don't need it till Friday. But it's going to be a bigger suitcase, Pete. Sorry, can't get it all in this one. So I'm going on holiday on Friday. A bit like all of us, you have to get ready to go on holiday, so you have to pack your bag, don't you? I'm very impressed by my travel company because they are clearly prepared for disorganised people. They've sent me a whole pack of information, tells me exactly where I have to be on every day, even tells me the days that the shops aren't open and I need to make sure I buy my lunch the day before. Very organised. Don't lose this, Pete. Oh, there's my, that's my packing list, just fallen out, look, cash list. But the company themselves sent me a, a packing list, a kit list for my holiday. Sue's shaking her head at the back. <laughs> I know, but it really does make sure that I'm ready for every eventuality on my holiday. So, 
I'm going to share with you a few of the things. So I've got to take, I've got to take shorts for the sunny days, but I've got to take long trousers for the not so sunny days. Well, that makes sense. I've got to take t-shirts, but I've got to take fleeces. Now, why do I need a fleece? Look, look at this sunshine. Why? Scotland. It's Scotland. I need a fleece because it's Scotland. I need to take my sun hat because obviously it's going to be sunny. And I've got somewhere in here, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, look, Chris, Avon. So Chris is an Avon. Right? I've got my Avon sun cream. Comes recommended, but there are other brands of sun cream that you can purchase. But I've also got to take my woolly hat. It's a good woolly hat. And my thick winter gloves. Why am I taking... Look at this weather. Why? Uh, it's, I've got to take... It's not rained, and we're in drought conditions, but I've got to take my water... I haven't put my waterproof coat in, Pete. I haven't finished my packing, clearly. I've got to take my waterproof trousers. I've got to take thinner gloves, walking socks, first aid kit, or a band... Now, these are very useful on windy days, if you've got lots of hair, like me. Pete doesn't need one of these. <sighs> keep the hair in place when you go up a wind, uh, windy hill um, yeah these are quite helpful there's other brands are available of these but yeah I don't respond well to insect bites there's always a bit of a panic if an insect gets me I've, to stop it. <laughs> no I've got as well hang on hang on Let, other brands are available insect repellent oh, do you think I'm ready Pete, Pete's responsible for the pen knife sweet says food, so there's definitely food on the list. Deep freeze for when I'm suffering a little bit with achy legs. Oh, I'm hoping not to use my emergency blanket, but that's on the list. Um, the thing that I'm most worried about is my feet. Right, I don't have good feet. <laughs> so, this is my best birthday present ever. Pete, Pete's a real one for spending money on expensive gifts. So it was a really big birthday, and this is what he bought me. Look at this. A collapsible washing up bowl. <laughs> it is the best gift, how long have we married? In 13 years, that he's ever bought me. And it's going in my suitcase. Why? Why? Because it goes along with my foot soak. Other brands are available. And every night in my B&B, I sit with my feet... They just about fit in, in my foot sake, for 10 minutes. Because I've got over 200 miles to walk, so I think I deserve a collapsible washing up bowl. Right. And the plasters. There's a lot of plasters, because I don't have good feet. I don't know why I walk, because I have really bad feet, and I always get blisters. But I think I'm ready for any eventuality, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Don't even go there. I'm not looking at that weather forecast yet. But it made me think, we get ready for so many things, don't we? I, mean, I get ready for messy church. I make sure everything's on the table, everything possible that those kids are going to need. A pair of scissors, sellotape. I write a risk assessment. There'll be no tripping over that wire. What else do we get? We get ready for Christmas. Oh, I mustn't talk about Christmas. It's only August. <laughs> We get, we get ready for so many things, and we're always thinking about what might go wrong, aren't we? We're always thinking about, well, what if that happens? Well, I'll do that. What if this happens? Well, I'll do that. Got it all covered. But what about in our Christian lives? Do we get ready for every eventuality when, as Christians? We often... Oh, someone's nodding their head. Well done. We often talk in our home group. Now, my home group are here today, so they'll tell me now if I'm not... So, we often say, well, I'm not quite ready for that question if someone at work asks me that question. And what would I say if someone asked me that? Well, no, I'll, I'll not tell them I'm a Christian, because Helen doesn't, obviously, because Helen's a top student in our home group. But you often think, don't you, what if I'm not ready for that question? I'm not ready to answer that. Well, what do we do? What are we going to... I'm going to need a big suitcase to have every answer to every question. What do we do? But then getting together like this on a Sunday is part of our preparation, isn't it? For going back out to talk to other people. And there's one thing that snuck in the 
that I've not told you that's in my book, my suitcase. I will need a bigger suitcase, though, Pete. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Me. One thing in my suitcase that I've not mentioned yet. Oh, look. The Bible. It's got all the answers, so I don't really need a big suitcase, do I, to walk around with a big rucksack on my back. What I need to make sure I'm doing is reading my Bible. Oh, I've got it the right way up. Look, it's not even upside down. Reading my Bible and making sure that I'm praying and talking to God when I need to. And when things are happening and I need to prepare, I don't need to worry so much about the list of all the things that it says I need, although I'm going to make sure that there's fly spray. <laughs> And I'm going to make sure there's lots of plasters. And my collapsible washing up bowl is definitely going on holiday with me. And rather a lot of other things, I think, to keep me going. But one thing I'm going to make sure is there, and it needs to be in our lives every day to make sure we're ready for the day, is that prayer time as well and spending time with God. And maybe that's what I need to put at the top of my kit list, not all those other things that are on that list, that whilst are really important for day-to-day -day stuff, we need to concentrate on what's important as well. And remember that God will be with us and he will prepare us. He'll be with us when we need to answer some of those questions that we think we're not ready for. I'm hoping that sets the scene a little bit for Alan's message. If not, Alan, you need to change your message. Right, okay? <laughs> oh, let's just say a short prayer before we sing uh, our next worship song this morning. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are always with us. I thank you that whatever's going on in my life, I can turn to you, Lord. And you can help to prepare me. And I don't need to worry sometimes about all those nitty-gritty bits of detail. I just need to remember to spend time with you and to read your word, Lord. In your name. Amen. <laughs>
our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in a spirit of praise and worship. And we thank you for all the blessings we receive each day. But we're also mindful that there are many people around this world who are also in need of our prayers. We think of this awful conflict in Ukraine and we pray for those who are fighting and for those who are sheltering from bombing, for those who have lost their homes and are separated from their families, those living in other countries, including our area. We pray for the work of the Baptist Mission distributing Bibles, and we pray for all those aid agencies who are trying to help. We pray for our own people who are, who are traveling to distribute aid and to take big equipment to the front. We pray for missionaries based in needy areas of this world, where there is drought or floods for areas ravaged by fire, where crops have failed and tree cover damaged. We pray especially for Lou and Pete, for Judy and for Andre and Deshi. Bless them abundantly and draw men and women to you through their service. We pray for the farmers in this country battling against the effects of climate change. We pray for the work of the fire service, especially at this difficult time. And Lord, we pray for politicians, big companies and corporations, and technical innovators, as they look to reverse the damage we have done to your world. We pray for our families and friends who are finding this weather very difficult, for those who are unwell, for those who struggle. Lord God, you who created this world, the sunshine, the wind and the rain, we earnestly pray for rain, to water the crops, to fill the rivers and the reservoirs, and show us how to be good stewards of your world. We pray for those who are on holiday and for those going on holiday. And we especially pray for those who are awaiting exam results this week and next week. And we pray, guide them, Lord, as they look to the future. May their plans be your plans. And we bring all these prayers to you in the loving and precious name of Jesus. Amen.
After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. <coughs> Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed. <coughs> Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. <coughs> The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Highlighted there that phrase, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Now if you had to write words to sum up those words, what might they be? It's an English composition lesson in school. One word perhaps would sum it up. Pain. Hmm? Gut-wrenching, soul-sickening, heart-wrenching pain in Jesus and in Peter. We're continuing to follow the journey of Simon Peter, the rough and ready Galilean fisherman who was called by Jesus to follow him. He had a good heart, there's no doubt about that, but boy did he have his faults and his failings and they are not disguised in the Gospels. Simon Peter could be brash, he could be volatile, he could be unpredictable. Do you know anybody like that? Oh, no, some yeah, do. elbows are going. He often spoke without first engaging his brain. And he didn't always live up to his own extravagant claims. His perceptions of himself and what he was capable of were, to say the least, exaggerated. And never more so than in this sad story. He should have been prepared. Let me remind you, Jesus told them this very night, You will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now here's Peter. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Well, of course, just a few hours later, those words came back to haunt Peter. As we look at the four Gospels, we realize it was a chilly night in spring. Apparently, Jerusalem, even within the city, can get quite cold at night in that season of the year. And inside the courtyard of Annas and Caiaphas, who sort of between them were high priests, there's a, a fire. John's Gospel adds the little touch that it was a charcoal fire which is preparing us for a few chapters later when the risen Christ prepared another charcoal filler, filler, fire. 
and asked Peter three times, Do you love me? In the scene, we find Peter edging closer to the open fire, and its flickering flames and its light must have revealed his face. And his northern accent betrayed the fact that he was from Galilee. And so he was challenged on more than one occasion to own up to his connection with Jesus. And we've seen from those references that defiantly he shouted, I don't even know the man. Have you ever let those shocking words really sink in? This is a hardcore lie from the very disciple who declared Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The disciple who had boasted that he would follow Jesus anywhere. A disciple who had insisted that he was willing to give everything for Jesus, including his life. I don't know the man. And the Gospels cover over the expletives that he then used as he denied knowing Jesus of Nazareth. And then, of course, the rooster crowed. And Jesus turned and looked straight at Peter. I wonder, what might an onlooker have seen in the face of Jesus? How might, how might one of the great artists have depicted the scene, trying to capture the drama and the emotion of that moment? Was there rebuke in the eyes of Jesus? Was there a triumphant, I told you so, in the face of Jesus? Was it condemnation? As in, that's it, we're through. The answer to above all three, I think, is no. You see, apparently, the words translated in our Bibles looked, when Jesus turned and looked at Jesus, it's a word that's usually associated with looking with interest, looking with concern, looking even with love. Uh, for example, we see it in the story of the rich young ruler. It's the same word. Jesus looked at him and what? And loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. How an artist would capture that turning of Jesus, that looking at Peter and convey love with the artist's brush, I've no idea. I'd be hopeless at it. But there's something of the gospel even in the way Jesus looked at his disciple Peter. Something else I wondered this last week. I wondered if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John ever questioned whether they should include Peter's denials in their Gospels. If they were modern authors, they would have asked for permission. <laughs> in case they got sued. I want us to remember the situation, what was going on in the world when the Gospels were written. They were at least 30 years after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Probably going on until between 30 and 60 years between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And they were written probably because they realized that the apostles were dying off and they needed to have a written account of all the stories that were circulating amongst the churches of what Jesus has said and done. And so they went to the apostles and asked them. And it's, uh, very often it's, it's believed that Mark's gospel contains the memories of Peter, that Mark would have got what he wrote from Peter himself. You know, I've said before, you could rename it the, apostle, the gospel according to Peter. And in that period, some 30 to 50 years after these events, the Roman authorities had twigged that Christianity was not just a sect of Judaism, so they left it to the Jews to do the persecuting. As more and more Gentiles were converted, it became a threat to the empire. And so the beginnings, the seeds of persecution were beginning to be sown. And the pressure was on Christians who, when the persecution was off, now to give up their faith. The persecutions saying, you must deny your faith if this, that, or the other, or look out. And in the second half of the first century, the heat is turned up on Christians to deny their faith. I've often thought, how would I fare in such a situation? I am always humbled whenever I read or we see a presentation of brothers and sisters around the world who are routinely persecuted for their faith today. I remember being shocked when I read that in the 20th century, more Christians had died for their faith than in all the previous centuries put together. Persecution is not a thing of the past. And it is still with us today. Here in this country, we, if we count our blessings, although the tide seems to be turning against evangelical, biblical faith, we didn't come here this morning afraid that somebody would walk in with a submachine gun and shoot us all. In other ways, though, have we faced such a temptation? But you see, in that context, in the first century, retelling the story of Peter's forceful denials in each of the four Gospels wasn't a case of wanting to embarrass Peter. Rather, you could draw the conclusion, if Peter, the great apostle, who on the day of Pentecost was the rock upon which Jesus started to build his church when he preached that day in the power of the Spirit and 3,000 plus people were converted and baptized, if he could fall so low and yet still be restored and used of God to build his church, then surely there was hope for anyone who had succumbed to the pressure to deny their faith. There was a way back. If Peter had a way back, anybody could have a way back. So I suspect that had Peter been asked for permission to include this rather embarrassing story, he might well have insisted that it be included. Given that so many of his brothers and sisters by the time this gospel was written were facing the kosh because they loved Jesus. Some may well have done by the time they read it what Peter had done. Can you imagine an early Christian having succumbed to this pressure to deny their faith, to call down curses upon themselves and say, I am not a Christian, I don't know this Jesus of Nazareth that you were talking about. And then they come in broken-hearted repentance. Can you imagine now, for the first time, hearing this story of Peter being read? They would have listened perhaps with bated breath. Peter did. Knowing that he had been restored, renewed. And so then they would be able to dismiss the lie of the devil that was being whispered in their ear that there was no way back. When there was a way back. And the Lord would welcome them with open arms. And through them again, build his church. 
A similar principle is at work in the story of Saul of Tarsus, the great apostle Paul. Right into Timothy, he says this, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. He was a self-righteous prig. <laughs> and Jesus' harshest words were for the self-righteous, not the sinners. If you were a self-righteous Pharisee, you were the worst of sinners. But for that very reason, Paul says, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. In other words, what Paul is saying is, if God can save me of all people, he can save anybody. If his grace can wash away my sin, not only the sins of all that filthy self-righteousness, but the sin of persecuting the body of Christ, the sin of taking Christians with it all starts there, you know, with Stephen, when a young man named Saul is looking after the cloaks, and then Saul is fired up, and of course he was on his way to Damascus with the authority written in his hand to persecute Christians, whoever he could find. And we know the story, how the risen Lord knocked him off his high horse. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I wonder how long the pause was before Saul of Tarsus said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so he says, if, the, if God can turn me around, he can turn anyone around. And people read in the Gospels and perhaps being shocked at the story of Peter, of all people. Wow, if there was hope for him, then please God, there is hope for me. Have you ever heard the devil whisper this lie in your ear? That's one time too many. God is through with you. Do not believe that lie. Jesus said, if you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But if you believe a lie, it will imprison you. Don't believe his lies. Believe the truth of the gospel. Believe the truth of this message. There is a way back in the amazing, over-the-top, ridiculously extravagant grace of our God. Of course, there are many ways in which we at various levels can deny our faith. How about, you know, saying nothing when we know we should have said something? Sometimes it's wise to say nothing. Don't get me wrong. But I can think of times when I should have said something and I've said nothing. I remember well as a teenage Christian walking home on a Saturday night um, from a church the other side of the valley from where I live. I was all fired up, full of the Lord, and willing to witness to anybody. Bring them on, Lord. So the Lord did, and I bottled it. You see, there was this older man coming out of a club, walking along Gethy Wastard Road. I could take you to the spot now in my hometown of Pontypridd. And as we got closer, the Lord said to him, witness to that man. <coughs> he was a bit big, and he'd obviously had a few beers. We got closer. Alan witnessed to that man. We were that close. I let him walk past. I felt the Lord say, turn round, go and speak to him. I carried on walking. I never did speak to him. Whenever I think of that, I pray, Lord, I hope you sent somebody else to talk to him. And I'm sorry I messed it up. I'm so sorry I bottled it. What if the Lord had said to me on that day, Alan, I've called you to the ministry. That's it. I've changed my mind. But no. We can deny him by keeping silent. We can deny him by just going with the flow, can't we? No, I've done that as well. 
go with the flow. I remember as a young Christian in school, nobody would have known that I was a Christian. I was a weekend Christian, but with the boys, I was just one of the boys. And when some of them were converted and I told them I was a Christian, they wouldn't believe me. And I'm not surprised. I was going with the flow, denying by my behavior and my language that I knew and loved the Lord, which I did. We can deny our Lord by being hypocritical. There are so many ways in which we, we do, we let the Lord down. Isn't it great that he is the God of all grace? Yes. Yes. The God of all grace. Now, who coined that phrase? It was Peter. A few of the words on the screen. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, and then that last phrase, will himself restore you. Peter had been restored. And make you strong. Peter had been made strong, firm and steadfast. This is the apostle saying this, writing these words, who had denied with expletive language three times that he even knew Jesus. I don't know where you are today on your journey of discipleship. I've been a pastor long enough to know that there are ups and downs. And sometimes the downs go deeper than the ups go uppest. That's a word. Do you know what? The God of all grace has got millennia of experience dealing graciously with the likes of you and of me. And we're celebrating that in the table before us now. The communion table, which, if you like, is that rededication, the reaffirmation of our baptismal vows that we would always follow, love and serve the Lord. It's a recognition as we take it each month and some traditions more than is once a week or even more of that, Lord, yep, yeah, I'm sorry, I have sinned, I've fallen short. Here I am again. And our Lord embraces us in his love and in his grace. And so, anticipating the message in a couple of weeks' time when we look at that occasion when uh, Jesus prepared the scene and set the breakfast and asked Peter pointedly three times, do you love me? Here is the grace that lay behind our Lord's restoration of Peter. And being forewarned is forearmed. Well, it didn't work for Peter on that night, did it? So let me just say this. Might it be that this morning, through this message, the Lord is forewarning us that we might face a test in this coming week of our allegiance to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, for all those times when we've bottled it and got it so horribly wrong, for all those times when we say, yep, Lord, we're with Peter in some way, shape, or form. Lord, forgive us. And thank you, thank you, thank you that you are the forgiving God. You are the God of all and abundant grace. Strengthen us strong in you and in your mighty power. And in this coming week, just as Kath and Pete pack their bags in readiness for anything that the weather might throw at them, will you pack our spiritual bags so that we are ready for whatever the world might throw at us? So that we say we love the Lord rather than deny him by our words and actions. So help us, God, we pray. Amen. So just a time of prayer then before we all share communion together. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body.
we still our minds and quieten our hearts as we prepare to approach your table, Lord. We ask that you draw us closer to you as we partake of this bread and wine in grateful remembrance of what you did for each of us. One Corinthians eleven reads For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it. This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Loving God, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and ministry announcing the good news of your kingdom and showing us its power by lifting up the downtrodden, healing the sick and loving the loveless. We thank you for his death upon the cross, for the redemption of the world and for raising him to life again as a foretaste of the glory we shall all share. We give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols of our world and signs of your transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, that we may be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and formed into his body. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. So we'll share the bread now. Feel free to take the bread as it's um, shared, and then we'll um, share the cup and then drink together. The body of Christ shared, given for you. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn. I cast my mind to Calvary.
the peace of Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. May God bless you all this week. Thank you for joining us this morning.